All right. Well, we have a very uh, brief time together, which I really appreciate. And I'm sure I'm just like one in a long list of interviews. You've been probably been doing them all day. So uh, for about six months, I've been doing about three interviews every day. But you know what? I enjoy doing it. It gives me a chance to talk about something I love. So let's do it. Yeah, I, I, just keeping that in mind, I'm going to try not to ask the same old question. I, mu I must have watched like hours of footage of you already. So I think I got all the basics. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry you had to go through that. Oh, that's cool. I, I, I enjoy it. Uh, I want to start off by saying that uh, Grey Days is a band that uh, unfortunately had a lot of tragedy. We have a, a member dying of cancer. There was some internal fights and, of course, a suicide. But I want to focus on the positive. This new album, from what I gather, is all about reconciliation, giving new life to an amazing voice that we lost, and honoring the life of a beloved musician. I want to know what emotions did you and the band feel when you played that that album when it was just in its completed state, you know, you just finished it. What emotions came up? Wow. So in the completed state, so I'm going to back up a little bit. When we started the, the emotional roller coaster kind of, it ran the gamut of everything. It went from sadness to love, to pain, to excitement. I mean, there's all those things. As we wrapped up, I remember very specifically as we sat in their control room at NRG Recording Studios, listening back to all the tracks we had just finished to make sure we didn't miss anything. That was the first time we listened to everything back. And I just had an overwhelming sense of pride. I had an overwhelming sense of, um, of love. I could feel Chester in the room. Um, I knew everybody else in that room felt the same way I did. We all felt an immense, um, overwhelming sensation of love and that it's hard to describe because I haven't had that too many times in my life that way but that specific moment I remember very well it was like uh, I would assume closing a chapter I yes this, this, this feeling of satisfaction it was definitely a feeling of accomplishment for sure like I can't believe we actually got this finished because there were so many hurdles to get there you know um and then we weren't even finished. That was just the recording part of it. Then we had another year and a half of work to do. Um, but at the time, you know, it felt like we had finished. And, and that, you know, the sense of pride and accomplishment and love that everyone was feeling was, was really a great moment. We know that this project was revived because of the phone call that you got from Chester. Uh, there was a reunion gig for Club Tattoo, the tattoo that you guys owned. And new stuff was in the works. Chester was really craving craving this, craving to continue with you guys. And then, of course, uh, we all know J July 20, 2017, everything changed. Uh, now, I have a friend who committed suicide. And decades later, I mean, we're talking, it's been almost 30 years. I'm still processing those feelings, those emotions, and especially the guilt. You know, I was, I was the one that talked him off the ledge so many times. And, you know, I go on vacation for two weeks, come back, he's gone. And it shows up in subconscious ways and guilt being the big one. Uh, has this new album helped you heal in any way? And if so, in what way? Well, Randall, first off, let me start by saying I'm sorry for your loss of your friend. Even though it was a long time ago, I still know that those scars are there and it doesn't seem to... The thing about suicide, if you lose somebody in a car accident, you understand the reason why. If you lose someone to cancer, you understand the reason why. When you lose someone to suicide, you don't. And there's that big question mark that hangs over that part of your life forever, unless you get a note or something like that. But even then, I'm sure it exists that way. So, you know, losing him the way that we did, I can 100% empathize and understand the guilt comment that you're saying, because I continually ask myself, what could I have done to prevent this? And the answer is nothing. I mean, I, the, the conscious, philosophical, um, logical side of me understands that the psychology involved in what happened, there's nothing I could have done as Sean, but that is still in my mind every day. What could I have done to prevent this? And I, I don't know how to get past that. It's one of those things that's always there. And I'm sure you, it sounds like you are too with your friend. Um, it's something I think about all the time. And, and, it breaks my heart to think that Chester 
thought so little of himself and valued himself so little that he felt like there was no other way out and no other way to uh, rebound from those feelings. And it's just, it breaks my heart. I know you bring something interesting. I think a lot of people, they think they know someone, especially an artist that writes with so much honesty. But in reality, only those close to that person really know who they are. So who was the real Chester? The one that only somebody close like you would know? He was one of the most compassionate and kind people I have ever met in my life. I never once saw him start a fight. I never once saw him start an argument. I always saw him trying to help other people. If we were in a grocery store and somebody dropped something 30 feet from us, he'd run over to try to help them pick it up. If somebody somebody's broke down on the side of the road, he'd want to pull over and help them. He was helping strangers all the time. <clears throat> he was very philanthropic and not because he had money and wanted to give it away. That's not the case at all. I know a lot of rich people that don't help other people. He genuinely wanted to make a difference in people's lives. And he genuinely understood other people's pain, especially when it came to children. He really resonated with the youth. Um, and he always wanted to do something impactful to help children uh, in a meaningful way. So he was just a very kind and generous human being. He was full of love. Who was he internally? He was somebody that didn't think he was deserving of love. And that is the tragedy in the Chester Bennington story, is he never felt like he was good enough and never felt like he deserved love. And that's something I still have a problem processing about him because he was so special to so many people. And I'm not talking about because he could sing. Um, I didn't look at him like he was this big singer. He was just my friend. And he was special because of the way he treated other people and the way he treated me. And he just was a kind, gentle soul that just wanted to be loved. Your little brother. Yeah, he was my little brother. That's, that's, that's absolutely true. To hear his voice again was, is kind of chilling. Uh, what has been the response from the fans so far to this project? Overwhelmingly, 99.9% .9 of them absolutely love what we've done. Um, they are getting an emotional connection back with somebody that they thought they'd never get again. And I think that that is a gift from Great Ace to the, the fans of Chester. That's the way it's being received. Um, they're getting closure for those people that maybe didn't get closure with his loss. Um, they're just getting another moment with somebody that they never thought they'd get again. And I think that's very special. I don't think we anticipated that response, but that's been um, the overwhelming feedback that we've been getting. Well, there's a couple people out there that think we're trying to grab money, but if they knew how little money was in the music industry, that they would just laugh. You know, I spent a hundred thousand dollars on this project myself. So I'm not going to be making money. And even if I did, it's going to be such a small amount that's not going to change my life. I'm a very successful entrepreneur. So I actually spent a ton of time, energy, and money making this right, making this project right, doing it for the right reasons, making sure that our intentions were on the level at all times. And we made this about Chester. And I think that is a very honorable project. And hopefully history will record it that way. If you would have, if you would have done this for the money, it would have came out two years ago. Yeah, Too completed, not done with care, just out the door, get some money in the bank. But I, I could tell that uh, the fact that you spent so much, three years is a long time to work on, on something. Uh, so I, I can definitely tell that that's true. Well, and we had, you know, the, the, the bottom line is we had much larger numbers coming from other record labels that we said no to because they didn't understand the project from the integrity side that we were coming from. They wanted to exploit it and the only guy that understood what we were trying to do was Tom Wally. He's like, we're not going to exploit this. We're going to do this for the right reason to make sure the original intention is kept in place. And if it's successful, it's because of that, not in spite of that. And he understood it from the moment go. And we got a lot less money from him than we did from two other big labels that through that was, that's all they were offering was money. And that's the last thing we were trying to go for. So that that's why we ended up going with Loma Vista is because Tom Wally absolutely understood the project and how important it was to do it and curate it the right way. You had some pretty big guests on that album, uh, from Korn, LP, Bush, Breaking Benjamin. 
the list goes on and on. Which guests did you most enjoy playing with personally? Oh, I'm not going to answer that. You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> uh, I actually enjoyed every single one of them for different reasons. And I'll, get, I'll, and I'll go down that list for you. So I did not know LP personally. But when I met her in the studio, I felt like she was one of the most genuine, um, honest, down-to-earth people uh, that I had met in a long time. And it was just a joy wanting, it was a joy working with her because I remember how much Chester loved her voice. So for me, it was like being able to connect the dots and do that for, you know, cause I know Chester would have loved to work with her. So working with monkey and head, those guys are just incredibly patient and they showed up so professional and they did, they didn't do this because they were trying to, those guys are so super famous. They didn't need the headache of this project. This was a lot of work for those guys. And they showed up so prepared and they contributed so much to the writing process that it was just a joy to work with those guys. And it always been, you know, a dream of mine to work with those guys. And, and I know Chester would have loved it because he loved those guys and they loved him. So uh, Chris Trainer, I didn't know from Bush. And I got to end up working with him the most out of everybody. He was incredibly... Um, forthcoming in the writing process with us. And he, he was such a big contributor in the writing process, I think on four of the songs. So mm. he was great to work with. And he, he became a close friend of mine through, the, through this whole project. Um, who am I forgetting? Paige Hamilton. I didn't know him, but I knew Chester was really close friends with him. Marcos Curiel from POD. He was close friends with Chester, never got to record a song with him. So we included him on this record. He was just very kind, very quiet. I didn't get to know him very well, but I know that that was something we were able to, once again, to connect those dots. And Marcos was so incredibly respectful to the project. So each person really brought something unique uh, to, the, to the project that I am very grateful to have been involved in. And probably one of your most special guests was uh, Chester's own son, Jamie. So I've known Jamie since he was born, um, obviously. And uh, it just hit me one day when we were in the studio, Chester never got to record with his kids. This is something we can give back to Chester as a gift. Like how often can you give something to somebody who's passed? Almost never. So it was a, it was a it was, wow, this is something we can do for him. How cool is that? Let's do that. So I reached out, literally I reached out to all the kids. I reached out to Talinda. And uh, I, I made the offer for uh, Lily, Lila, and Tyler to come in. And she just thought that they were too young. And I totally understood and respected that de decision. I reached out to Draven and Samantha. And uh, at first, Draven was, really wanted to be involved. And then I think as time went on, he was just a little bit more apprehensive and uncomfortable with it, which is fine. And then I reached out to Jamie. And as soon as Jamie understood what we were doing, he was like, I'm in. I get it. I think he realized at his... Um, age that this was kind of a once in a lifetime thing this isn't going to keep coming around and if he wanted the chance to actually sing with his father this was the time to do it now or never yeah well, and he did a great job he sings backing vocals on a song called soul song and his dad would have been so proud of him he did a really good job and i we even see him in the video uh our time is almost up so i i want to say that you've given a a voice to someone who left us left us way too early you're allowing fans to discover even a softer side of, of Chester uh, in the way he's singing in this uh, album release. And you get to honor him with this project. Um, and we know that there might be more. There was more, uh, there's more songs, so we never know. Um, the last question is more for you. Uh, kind of a fun question. I know tattoos are a big part of your life and uh, for Chester, uh, something that you both shared, both owning the, the tattoo shop. If you could only keep one tattoo, which one would it be and why? Well, I have a matching tattoo with my wife that is a love, it's a love magic rune, um, Celtic rune. And to me, that's, that's something I share with my wife. So that would probably, if I could only keep one, that would probably be the one. Uh, my favorite tattoo artistically is, uh, I have a, a, a picture of Guan Yin. She's the goddess of compassion and mercy on my forearm. And I, I look at that uh, when I'm feeling like a jerk and remind myself to, to be compassionate and try to understand what other people are going through with their struggles and try to be a better person and, and help them rather than hurt them. So uh, all my tattoos mean something, but to answer your question, it would be my love magic rune on my back. I think you, you mentioned something just in, in, uh, as we end this, uh, very interesting of having a reminder of something, some, something that speaks to you when you're feeling uh, down. 
And I, I think uh, just to wrap this all up and the tragedy that we had, uh, which I'm glad that you're that you've brought this up uh, and making this project. Uh, but uh, if anybody has those feelings of of being depressed and down, you know, maybe this is an album that they can go to to uh, remind themselves that life is beautiful and uh, life does go on and and there is a there is an end to pain eventually. Uh, you just you know take it day by day, uh, sometimes hour by hour or even minute by minute, but. Uh, uh, keep going. I, I think uh, there was one line uh, that you you mentioned. I'm just going to end with this. Uh, the the theme of the album was from a kind of uh, Maury Sky. If I had a second chance, I make amends. And I think this uh, really sums up uh, the project. So thank you so much for your time, Randall. Great interview. Thank you so much. You asked some really pointing questions, and thank you. Thank you for having me on today. I try to make it different. You did. Thank you. Thanks, Sean.